Last week we saw that the, when you enter into a Reformed church, you do not find at the front of the church a priest who's there to officiate in an altar where a sacrifice is made on behalf of the congregation. Rather, you have a minister of the Word who opens the Word and publicly proclaims Christ to you, pointing to the cross of Christ, where our sins have been atoned for once and for all. And so the Reformed faith presents a different view of worship. We, we do not come to make an offering before God to find acceptance with Him through that offering. Rather, that offering has already been made at the cross. Because of what Christ has done long ago, we are set free from our sins. We are liberated. We are brought into God's very family. Today I want to focus more on the sacrifice itself, the death of Christ and what it means for us. And to do that we look to what Moses uh, spoke of in the opening chapters of his book of Leviticus, where he gives the uh, instructions that the Lord has for the use of sacrifices within the tent of meeting, within the tabernacle, eventually the temple. And when you look through the first six chapters of the book of Leviticus, a variety of offerings are made there uh, on the altar before the Lord. There are burnt offerings, there are grain offerings, there are a wide variety of uh, animals that are used for these offerings. Those who are of substance can provide a bull or a, a goat, a, a lamb for the offering. Uh, those who are poor might bring a bird or a grain offering or something to that effect. So God provides for his people a variety of ways in which they might approach him with their offerings. These offerings are typical in nature. They were designed to show Israel a number of things, to instruct them, to teach them of the nature of their sin, the consequences of their sin, and the remedy that God has provided for us. When we look at Leviticus chapter 1, we see that the Lord, first of all, reveals to Moses uh, the way that the sacrifices ought to be presented to him. In the first couple of verses, God meets with Moses at the tent of meeting and explains to him what should take place when Israel brings their offerings before the Lord in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. And by so doing, the Lord shows to Moses uh, that he, he is bringing instructions that will uh, guide the people as to the proper way in which they are to approach him. And the one point that I would like to make about these offerings that are presented here for us is that they come within the context of the covenant, God's covenant relationship with his people. It's the Lord who makes this presentation to Moses, the mediator for Israel. And so the offerings are presented to Israel to instruct them as to how they are to approach the Lord. It's all part of this covenant relationship that God has with his people. The offerings are not presented to all men and all nations indiscriminately, they are given to Israel for her benefit so that she might approach the Lord in the proper way. We see here at the very start of these offerings something of the particular character of these offerings. They are designed for the people of God, for their redemption. They are not indiscriminate offerings. Furthermore, we see in these offerings that God reveals them from the tent of meeting, thus giving a certain priority or, if you will, uh, authority to what God has to say about these things. God reveals himself in many ways to Moses at the tent of meeting or privately through uh, visions and dreams and so forth. But here at the tent of meeting, it's God face to face with Moses, explaining to him how he is to come before the Lord and bring offerings to him. And so there is a certain authority that comes with these offerings. This is God's prescription, God's way of approaching Him. We're not then free to imagine our own way of approaching God, bringing to Him the sacrifices that we think are best. God Himself instructs us as to the proper way in which we are to approach Him. So the Lord speaks to Moses from the tent of meeting. It's a personal revelation 
to God's people, included within his covenant relationship. And Moses himself is set up as the mediator. God could have spoken to Israel directly about the offerings, but he spoke to them through Moses. Moses would have a role of a mediator. And so God intentionally presents his will in this regard through the mediator to point us to a greater mediator who is yet to come, who would provide us with the final sacrifice in Christ himself. This would not be the first time that burnt offerings would be brought before the Lord. Moses himself would record many times when burnt offerings were brought before the Lord after the flood of Noah. You recall Noah as they entered into the land that after having been destroyed by the flood, uh, Noah comes before the Lord and makes a burnt offering of the clean animals that were there on the ark. And the Lord comes and he smells the aroma of the offerings and he's pleased and he makes a covenant promise to Noah that no longer will he punish men in this same way. More profoundly, perhaps, you have the example of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham is instructed to, to go up to the mountain and to make an offering of his son before the Lord, his only son, the son that he loved. And so Abraham takes Isaac, his only son, on this journey of three days up towards this mountain. He's along with other servants, and he tells the servants to stay behind while his son and he go up to the top of the mountain. Isaac looks at his father and says, Father, I see the, the sticks for the fire. I see the, the knife. We have a fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? The call Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb. They get up to the top of the mountain. The altar is uh, made. The wood is placed on the, the altar. And then... Abraham takes his son, places him on the altar, binds him there on that altar, reaches out for his knife, rises up that knife, a knife about to slaughter his son according to God's command. And it's just that moment that the angel of the Lord appears and says, Abraham, Abraham, don't strike your son. I see now that you uh, obey me fully. And so, a substitute for Isaac was provided. There was a lamb caught in the thickets that Abraham was instructed to take out. Isaac was brought down. The lamb was put up. Isaac would not be the final sacrifice for sins. His blood, even if it was spilled, was not sufficient to take away sin. Isaac was a sinner just as Abraham was. He could not even atone for his own sin, let alone for anyone else's sin. And so... God used this drama of sacrifice to instruct His people about what He Himself would do in sending His own Son into the world to be a sacrifice for sin. Only for this Son, the stroke of the hand would not be held back, but His Son would be crucified on that cross and would die. Why? Because this Son could atone for sin. This son was able to wash us from our sins. No other son of Adam could do that. Only Jesus. And so Moses tells us of Abraham and the offering that God called upon him to make. We saw earlier in Genesis, excuse me, Exodus chapter 24 when God makes a covenant with his people. Moses gathered Israel before him and he made an offering, a burnt offering on the altar and then sprinkled the people in the book of the covenant with, and the altar with the blood, signifying the death of the, the, the sacrificial victim. God provides a sacrifice for his people to take away their sins. The greatest event for atonement in Israel would be would take place on the Day of Atonement, which I believe is recorded in Leviticus chapter 16, all the instructions there. You have the, the offerings that are made before the Lord, and most especially you have the, uh, the goats that are offered before the Lord. On one goat the priest names the sins of the people of God upon the head of the goat. That goat is slaughtered and offered up before the Lord. The second goat has the same treatment and he's let go and escapes out into the wilderness.
God in these various ways tries to show us something of the work of Christ and what He would do for us. No one sacrifice would fully explain the work of Christ. And so what we have in the book of Leviticus and throughout the Old Covenant are a variety of sacrifices that are given to show us different aspects of the work of Christ. When you look at the uh, burnt offering that's described here in Leviticus chapter 1, you see that there are a variety of prescriptions with regard to that offering. The sacrifice was, first of all, uh, to be a perfect sacrifice, a male without defect. This animal was to be brought before the Lord and it was to be examined. It was to be without defect. Why was that the case? Well, did it represent the, the sinner and the sinner's Perfection? Obviously not. But this animal was required to be perfect because it was to stand in the place of the individual, bearing their sin, providing a righteousness that they did not have. It was to be a pure offering before the Lord. So it was to be an animal without defect, pointing ahead to the Christ who would come, who himself would be without sin. The New Testament tells us of Jesus as one who is blameless, without fault. The Apostle Peter describes Jesus as one who is unblemished. And that uh, idea of being blameless picks up from these uh, ancient sacrifices. The animal had to be perfect. So Jesus was the spotless Lamb of God, who had no sin of his own to atone for. And so the animal had to be perfect, without defect. Second, the animal would need to be presented before the Lord at His altar, at the tent of meeting. You couldn't just present the animal anywhere you wanted to. But in this situation, it had to be at the altar of the Lord, the, Lord, the altar that the Lord Himself set up for His people. There is one place for an offering. So Christ would come make the, the great offering before God Himself in heaven for us. Uh, the one place where sins could be atoned for. In other words, it had to be presented to God Himself. There needed to be a true sacrifice to the Lord, and not just to other gods. Other forms of sacrifice would not be acceptable to the Lord. An offering to other gods was misdirected. It had to be presented before the Lord. The animal had to be sacrificed. The worshiper would himself slaughter the, the bull, cutting its throat, allowing the blood to spill. And then the priest would take that blood and sprinkle it upon the altar, signifying that atonement needed to be made for the sinner. Uh, the, the, offer, or the, the worshiper would put his hands on that animal sacrifice, indicating that this animal stood for him and stood in his place. Now surely, as the writer to the Hebrews makes it plain, animal offerings cannot really truly atone for sin. They were inadequate. But they were symbolic. They were typical. They pointed ahead to what God would provide for his people in the Christ. Here in Jesus, we see someone who has our humanity, who is able to suffer and die for us lay down his life as an atoning sacrifice for sins. The sacrifice had to be put to death. In this way, in the shedding of blood, God revealed his wrath against sin and sinners. God's justice has to be satisfied. Sin must be punished, either in the sinner or in the substitute. And this is an area where modern theology and many folks uh, rebel against the reformed understanding of sacrifice. Our understanding of these sacrifices is that they are penal in nature. That they are an expression of God's wrath against sin and they satisfy God's justice. Sin must be punished. Otherwise, God is not just. Modern theology, God just expresses forgiveness, it says it's okay, you're free to go. But where is the justice in that? 
if we bring our lawsuit into a court of law and, and uh, the criminal uh, against whom we're appealing is forgiven by the judge and just says, okay, you can go free, where's the justice in that? We cry out against that. I want to be satisfied. Punishment must be made. And so God, in order to be just, must punish sin. And that is what the sacrifice reveals. The worshiper puts his hand on the sacrifice, indicating the sacrifice stands for him. His sins are transferred to that animal. And with the death of the animal is the punishment that is due to that individual for their sins. Not only was the animal inadequate to take away his sins, there had to be a repetition of these animal sacrifices throughout the temple worship. That repetition would cease with the coming of Christ. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that Christ's death on the cross would be once for all. He makes that point repeatedly in the book of Hebrews, chapters 7, 9, and 10. He came once for all to make a sacrifice for sin. There's no further need for sacrifices. So when Christ lays down his life, it is a complete offering of himself. So all the Old Testament sacrifices came to an end. There was no further need for these animal sacrifices. The reality has come. Christ has provided us with an atoning sacrifice for sin. And because that's the case, in this new covenant age, we do not have any further sacrifices. We do not have an altar in our churches. The Mass is not celebrated as a sacrifice for sin. Christ has died and provided a perfect sacrifice. There's no further need for any additional sacrifices. Any return to the sacrifices is an abuse of Christ's once for all sacrifice for sin. Roman Catholics describe their Mass as an unbloody sacrifice as compared to the bloody sacrifice of the cross. Now that's a rather odd position to take, don't you think? They are the ones who assert that in the Mass the priest uh, changes the bread and cup into the body and blood of Christ. They are really the body and blood of Christ and he sacrifices them in front of the congregation. Well, that's really the blood of Christ being shed isn't that a bloody sacrifice? How can you say it's a non-bloody sacrifice? You're going against your own description of what the Mass is. We do not have any further offerings to make to atone for our sins. Christ's sacrifice of the cross is sufficient. It takes away all of our sins. And so the sacrifice needed to be made by the, made by the worshiper. It was consecrated then to God. The whole offering there on that altar would be burned up before the Lord, consumed in its entirety before the Lord. And this would uh, signify that the, the worshiper was to give himself entirely over to the Lord. Giving himself fully to the Lord and the Lord's and, and obeying the Lord. So it is Christ offered himself up completely to the Father, obeying him in every way, perfectly and completely. And so the offering there at the uh, altar of long ago was a way in which Moses and the Lord through Moses showed us the coming of Christ and what Christ would accomplish for us by his own death on the cross. Some in our modern age try to resist this idea of the penal substitutionary or vicarious death of Christ on the cross. They reject the idea that God is a God who is at wrath against sinners, that He must punish sin, and further that He would punish His Son in our place. Bishop John Shelby Spahn so rejects that notion that it, he says he would run from such a God who would punish His Son in our place. Now, others even in evangelical circles, are arguing against the notion of a penal substitutionary atonement. Rather, they say that we have in Christ's death a non-violent offering of Himself for us. God sees His sacrifice, His laying down of His life, 
And in love, He looks upon us and He forgives us. Not that in wrath He comes against His Son and punishes Him for our sins. No, God just simply loves us and forgives. Again, that is an antinomian approach to the work of Christ. It's against the law. It's hostile to God's justice. And it's an offense to God. Current notions of nonviolence applied to the cross of Christ bring us away from a, a proper appreciation for, for what Christ has done for us in laying down His life as an atoning sacrifice for sin. He bore the wrath of God for us. When we fail to appreciate that, we fail thereby to appreciate His great love for us. He went through that for you and I. Nothing less. That's what stood before Him at the cross. Not simply loss of a life or... Uh, Submitting himself to uh, wicked uh, actions on the part of the Roman soldiers and the jealousy of the priests and so forth. No. He gave himself to suffer the wrath of God for sin. That is the expression of his love. And the Father's love similarly is that great. That he was willing to give up his son for us. Allow him to suffer and die for us so that we might be redeemed. The Son who, through His obedience, would accomplish our redemption. Then the Father would joyfully raise Him up from the dead and bring Him into His heavenly courts, triumphant over death and sin. A non-violent approach to the Gospel is a denial of the Gospel, a denial of Christ's work on our behalf. You cannot escape penal substitution, a sacrifice for sin. Even the secular world understands that. They do it in their own corrupt ways. Uh, William Edgar, in a, a chapter he wrote for a book on Justified in Christ, uh, writes about the nature of the atonement, and he refers to the time of the uh, French Revolution in 1789, when a young a uh, journalist stood up on a table called uh, the Table Magic, the, uh, the mag symbolizing the magic of utopia. And there in a cafe in, in France, he stands up on this table with uh, folks around him and he argues against the 1%, really, the wealthy there in France, the king and all those who are in power. And they want to rise up. They were opposed to the fact that the Minister of Finance was uh, taken out of office. He was apparently a commoner. He was removed from office and, uh, I guess, put into prison. And so they were all upset with this. And they began to form a mob and a crowd. They stormed the Bastille. They released the prisoners. And then they set up a purge of France. They had to cleanse France of all its impure elements. And there was an argument against the, the Roman Catholic Church at the time, also the royalty as well. And King Louis, the, I believe the, was it the 16th, was executed there at, at that time. What was the means of execution? It was the guillotine. A blade which would fall down and, and sever the head from the shoulders. He was described by a, a, a doctor as the most humane way of executing people, but they made a lot of use of that guillotine. Anyone who did not submit to the new revolution, who did not follow reason as the, the, the goddess of the, the new empire, would come to an untimely end. And so the nation would be purged of all its impure elements. When you Deny the crucifixion of Christ and His substitutionary death on the cross. When you re rebel against Christ and His work and substitute that man's way of doing things, you do not escape atonement. You do not escape a purge or wrath or some pursuit of justice. Whether it's in the French Revolution, the Nazi Holocaust, which blamed the Jews for all the problems that they were experiencing, whether it's in the uh, ethnic cleansing that takes place 
in Yugoslavia and Serbia or other places around the world, man in his rejection and defiance against God and his ways still wants to have a purging of humanity. The communists and the way that they killed many of their own people. There must be an atonement. Will it be man establishing his own way of atonement or God's provision of atonement through Christ? Christ is the one way which fully and completely takes away our sin, restores us into the favor of God, and reconciles those who are at odds, bringing Jew and Gentile into one church, making them one people of God, reconciling people of all different stratas of life. The Hebrew, the Greek, the rich, the poor, come together in Christ under His gospel. And peace is obtained through His death on the cross. Because He takes away the wrath of God. He restores us into the favor of God. Making us right with God. Christ is the one final sacrifice for sins. And if we trust in Christ, He will liberate us from sin and death. And enable us to live for God. And transform the world. Christ, Jesus, one sacrifice for sins. Father, as many rebel against the teaching of your word, against the work of Christ on the cross, and try to devise other theories to explain away your justice uh, and your provision, your great grace, we pray that you would help us to understand what you have done for us. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, melt our hearts, that we would turn away from sin and wickedness and offer ourselves up to you as a sweet-smelling offering, completely devoted to you and to your service. We ask it in Jesus' name.